What's going on Mr. Lear and this is the second part of the industry unit and we will be continuing the measurements of development, talk about how gender roles play in the process of development and delve into the logistics behind trade and industry such as special economic zones. First and foremost, let's finish our last measurement of development, which is going to be the Human Development Index, also known as the HDI. And this index is a combination of three measurements, life expectancy, the average age someone is expected to live to, GNI per capita, so how much money the country makes on average, and education, what percentage of students go to secondary and post-secondary school. Then we also have the Gender Inequality Index, which measures development based on the rights that women experience in the country. This includes the percentage of women in the workforce, reproductive health, such as access to birth control, and empowerment, which can be measured by looking at the number of government seats that women control. Despite the fact that many countries have successfully narrowed the gap between men and women, a gender gap exists as women do not experience equality in wages or employment opportunities in many parts of the world. There is a direct correlation between the development of a country and the social rights that women experience. If the female population is forced by society to carry on with the traditional gender roles of taking care of the children and being the stay-at-home mother, they will have less opportunities for themselves. Some other ways that women might experience this gender gap is with property rights, as the lack of opportunity in buying land can severely limit a person's opportunity and driving rights, as in places like Saudi Arabia, women barely got the right to drive in 2018. Other methods of assisting women during the development process would be through microloans. Think of microloans as small banks that give out loans of cash to women. This line of credit provides opportunities for women to further themselves economically. This can be seen in an amazing documentary called Living on Dollar, which is free on YouTube, and I highly recommend it, where a woman named Rosa uses this loan to make blankets and use that money to fund her education. Now let's dive into the dynamic between trade and the world economy and how the world is becoming interdependent on one another, starting with complementary advantages. Complementary advantages are the advantages that countries gain as a result of producing products that complement each other. Take Japan, a country that produces many automobiles because of companies like Honda and Toyota. They are likely to trade with Thailand because Thailand is one of the largest rubber exporters and rubber goes into making tires. These two goods complement each other so that Thailand has an advantage in trading with Japan and vice versa. Then we have comparative advantage, and in this case, let's take Egypt, who produces large amounts of petroleum because of the large oil deposits that they have access to. They have an advantage over countries like Poland, whose environmental situation does not allow them to produce petroleum because of their dry and cool climate. Poland, however, can produce cattle at a much more efficient rate than Egypt can. This means that Poland has a comparative advantage in producing beef and because Poland will need petroleum to drive and Egypt will want to consume beef, they will utilize a comparative advantage to produce what they're good at in order to get what they need through trade. This concept can be translated to other nations as well, like if Egypt wanted to take advantage of the comparative advantage that India has with bananas. However, this trade can sometimes be discouraged by the government and they do so by utilizing tariffs. Imagine my Lamborghini Huracan was produced by the United States and that it costed 20 large ones. Then imagine a Subaru STI, which is produced in Japan and imagine this car only costed 18 grand. As a reasonable consumer, I am more likely to buy the Japanese car because it is cheaper and to incentivize my purchase of an American car, Uncle Sam will slap a tariff of $4,000 on top of the 18 grand, which makes it 22 large. Boom! Two plus two is four, minus one, that's three, quick maths. To get around these tariffs, countries are participating in neoliberal policies, such as free trade agreements and organizations such as OPEC, which includes the large petroleum producing countries, and they coordinate oil production with one another. Then you have the European Union and they establish the concept of free trade for countries who participate in the EU. This makes it so that the countries who are a part of the EU are more likely to trade with one another, thus advancing their respective economies. Also, if they are part of the Schengen, the countries are granted free travel to ensure the flow of goods across Europe. This is so that you don't have to show your passport every time you hit a border in Europe. Mercosur is a very similar system to the EU that's in South America, and this directly translates to the common market of the South, and they also promote the free flow of goods and people across the participating countries. You also have the World Trade Organization who establishes the rules of trade and ensures that trade flows smoothly and that it is fair. 
However, this does not mean that the members of the WTO are insured tariff-free trade with one another. This is simply an overarching organization that oversees trade. This sense of interdependence and globalization does come with this share of drawbacks because countries are so connected with one another when a big institution or country experiences a debt crisis like we saw in the United States with the 2008 housing crisis, other countries can experience the same as shown in the graph above. Notice how every other country's GDP was affected by the United States failure to manage their banking practices. In the previous video, we talked about how the manufacturing work is now being outsourced to semi-periphery countries like China and Mexico, and their governments establish manufacturing zones to incentivize the utilization of their services. An example of this would be the special economic zones in China like Shenzhen, Shantou, or Xiamen. These regions are given special permissions by the government so that they can receive tax benefits and so that they are exempt from trade regulations. Think of special economic zones as an overarching term and that there are specific forms of SEZs like free trade zones and export processing zones. A free trade zone is a class of an SEZ where goods are stored, reconfigured, and re-exported under special circumstances where taxes and tariffs won't be imposed. Think of an FTZ as a middleman that repackages or processes a good before hitting the consumers. The people of these countries or regions would be given an opportunity to work in these free trade zones and this would stimulate their economies. Notice how FTZs tend to be in the developing world as corporations are not going to want to pay the high wages of a developed country when processing their goods. Then lastly, we have an export processing zone and as the term explicitly states, the primary focus for this region would be manufactured exports. Once again, these regions create jobs, generate income for the citizens, and attract foreign investment. A really good example of an EPZ would be the maquiladoras in Mexico. Notice how the largest percentages of maquiladoras are near the border and this is due to the fact that maquiladoras, for the most part, are systems that the United States utilizes as a developed consumer country and thus the manufacturing zones want to be closer to the corporations of the United States. In case that was a bit much to digest, I did create this diagram, so feel free to pause the video and copy this information down. Let's switch gears and talk about the Fordist model of manufacturing which began in the early 1900s with Henry Ford establishing his highly effective assembly line system and systematic method of producing cars. On this assembly line, certain people would be in charge of particular jobs, so one person would be in charge of the wheels, one on the window, so on and so forth. A key characteristic of Fordism was to have a massive inventory so that the products were readily available for purchase. The contemporary economic landscape, however, has now transformed into the post-Fordist method where there is flexible production with parts that are produced in various places around the world, just-in-time delivery where goods are only produced as orders come in, customization with customers adding their own preferences to the good, and lastly, it is characterized by the reliance on machines in the production process. Let's take your iPhone 12. No longer are these products simply designed and produced in one factory. They are designed in growth poles, like Silicon Valley, put together in China with resources extracted from various parts of the world, and then sold to the consumers. These phones are customizable with their storage sizes and colors, and Apple utilizes just-in-time delivery, which means that as they see the increasing demand, they will produce more to stock up the Apple stores. Contemporary economics is also driven by terms like the multiplier effect, which states that initial spending will spur and fuel further economic development. And this is similar to concepts like the economies of scale, that the larger your company becomes, the more efficient it is and the more profits it can extract. We're also seeing agglomeration and growth pulse across all sectors in both developed and developing countries. This is the most prevalent with the high-tech sector, specifically Silicon Valley and their Apple headquarters. All of this development is leading to questions about whether or not the environment will be able to keep up. There are quite a few problems that are rooted in resource depletion, the effect of pollution and trash, unsustainable mass consumption, and the issue of global warming. To deal with such issues, but all the while maintain industries, a concept known as ecotourism has been introduced, which provides an opportunity for tourism and hospitality jobs to flourish while being environmentally friendly. These tourist spots preserve wildlife as much as possible and are less invasive to ecosystems, such as this spot in Thailand. 
Notice how the trees are not cut down. There aren't massive beaches forcibly carved out by mankind, and it looks as though wildlife still exists in this area. The United Nations does try to foster this responsible development as their sustainable development goals focus on eradicating hunger, maintaining good health, achieving gender equality, all while being mindful of life on Earth and being responsible consumers. Their goal is to try and protect the planet in poverty and promote peace, and they hope to achieve these goals by the year 2030. All right, well, that is it for part two of the industry unit. I appreciate you all for tuning in, and I will see you in the next one.